All right, now, everybody. Quiet, listen to me. We're going to start a show. Now, some of you people have been with me before. You know it's going to be a tough grind. But we're going to have a show. And hello all on this Wednesday. So cool to have everybody in the mix. Albert is here. Albert, thank you. He probably just got home from his other job. What time did you get in uh, last night, Albert? Uh, I usually usually around uh, 2. 2 a.m. 1.30, 1.30, 1.32, that kind. So the later start time is actually good for you on this show, isn't it? Yeah, so uh, that, that was <laughs> yeah. really nice. I was like, wow, I could get some, a little more sleep now. So. And Kim. Kim, how are you? Hello. What up with you? Uh, same uh, old stuff, you know. I saw the uh, Nicki Madaro show today. Kind of oh. like still some anniversary stuff going on there, which is cool. Because yeah. we also have anniversary stuff. Yeah. We have more so, videos to play and more messages to read. We have a couple more videos, a yeah, couple more times. messages, and we've yeah. also got a lot of big news. I don't need to tell you that there is a pretty significant revelation in that hospital blast yeah. that may really <laughs> let the Israelis off the hook. But... And there is a big but. Most of the Arab world and most of the Israeli-hating world will never care that there's anything that, uh, you know, that uh, in any way clears the Israelis. I mean, they're not going to. The word on the street is the Israelis did this, and that feeds the narrative that the Israelis are this... Um, you know, evil force in the region. And so if you have a populace that's already prone to hate on Israel for all the reasons that many of you may feel are completely legitimate, I think there are serious issues in the region, certainly serious issues in Gaza, uh, then you don't really care for any narrative or any evidence that lets the Israelis off the hook. We, though... I think I'd suggest respectfully in the developed world of the West, we do care. So the emergence of this new evidence, which I'll get to in a moment, that does help shed light, I think, on two things. First, if its legitimacy is really borne out, it does indicate that the Israelis didn't bomb a hospital. They just didn't. And when you hear Israeli spokespeople talk about this, they talk about the fact that they don't bomb hospitals. They just don't do it. Now, you may say, yeah, right, exactly. Israeli officials say a lot of stuff that's not true. So, you know, again, in war, there are going to be mistakes and there are going to be denials. And there's that old line, the first casualty of war is the truth. Mm-hmm. And so in keeping with that, we will talk about what's going on in Gaza with this hospital. I will play for you the recording that actually is an audio recording of two Hamas affiliated people talking about what happened at the hospital. Again, at least that's what it is represented as a being. So. John Rothman with his bottom of the hour. He weighs in on that. I'm just beginning his book, uh, which is really an interesting thing. It's kind of how religious leadership back in the 40s were lining themselves up with Hitler to try to pursue, essentially, the arm of the Third Reich in the Middle East. Anyway, well, I mean, that's a... Probably a poor summary of it. John would, I'm sure, have a better summary of it, but <laughs> uh, but it's really intriguing. So, uh, but John is here when it comes to Middle East history and the like. Um, I think he's very, very good. And I know, you know, John is upfront about the fact that you know he tries to represent these uh, arguments as even-handedly as he can. So, uh, there's also big news out of Washington D.C. and it's a uh, pretty. Um, I think it's significant. The Mark Thompson Show. He is a two-time loser, this Jim Jordan, <laughs> the Republican from Ohio, the flame-throwing hate machine. 
He was trying to win the House Speaker's gavel, but uh, couldn't get the 217 votes he needed. He had worse today than he did yesterday. Yesterday, there were 20 people that voted for some other candidate that could have voted for him. And today, there's 22. So he's losing ground. He's a an election denier. He is, uh, as we have told you before, and as you no doubt are aware already, he clearly had some kind of communications on an ongoing basis with Donald Trump, who is his Lord and Savior, clearly. And on J6, he continued to communicate with Trump. And so when you look at Jim Jordan, uh, he's a despicable guy. I mean, this is to leave aside, of course, you know, the cover-up that he was part of for sexual abuse that was going on in his men's wrestling program Mm -hmm. that he was aware of, multiple uh, pieces of testimony have indicated that in multiple different forums and venues. This guy is despicable is the word that comes to mind. Happy to see him go down. But here's the other thing I I, I didn't know, but here's the... Mm -hmm. Here's the other thing I mentioned to you the other day, and I thought to myself, I wonder if people really understand what I mean when I say Jim Jordan, because Kim, you were saying, you know, uh, Jim Jordan, uh, he can make deals and give it, give it up, but he doesn't seem like the kind of guy who wants to make a deal. Right. And I was saying it's worse than that. He really pursues a policy of intimidation. He yeah. literally tries to intimidate his way to the speakership. And here, afterwards, I thought, I wonder if people really get how that's a real thing. Yeah. And so here is what I'm talking about. An example, the wife of North Carolina Congressman Don Bacon got anonymous text messages warning her husband to back Jim Jordan as speaker or he will not hold any political office ever again. Remember I told you about the robocalls and all the ways yeah. that they were going to pressure in the district? Here it is. And that's what I was going to say is you were totally right. Because even uh, Representative Nick LaLotta is saying the pressure campaign from Jordan's allies hasn't worked, has only made members opposing Jordan dig in even more. And you see the the not only the pressure, but the intimidation, as you just mentioned. Yeah, you had it right yesterday for sure. It's outrageous. The guy is a bully. And he tried to bully himself into the House speakership, and it's not working out for him. As you say, Kim, he is falling shorter today than he did in the last vote. Yeah. LaLotta calls it a tactical error for Jordan to go to the floor today and lose even more votes. He said, I think him losing ground is probably evidence that it was a tactical error to bring it to the floor without ironing any of these issues out. So... This uh, Round Congress- two. Congressman Beep. Don Bacon, he's a Republican mm-hmm. from Nebraska. He was one of the most notorious holdouts on Jordan from the GOP side. And this is a guy who took a lot of heat from right-wing media. Brian Kilmeade called him a, called him a dumbass mm-hmm. on Fox. Um, and then <laughs> his wife got these you know, Messages, intimidating yeah. texts, these message, messages sent to her phone. And it's like, is that really going to make someone vote for you? No, it's not going to make someone vote for you. Are you threatening and cajoling people and be belittling and berating? You know. Well, uh, let me tell you, Kim, I actually disagree with you on this. Donald Trump exists as a political entity as he is leading the GOP, even though I understand that, you know, you know reasonable minds could differ as to whether or not he may win the presidency. But he is... Someone who has really gone yeah. uh, unchastened, you know, he's not been leashed. There is no attempt to put him on a leash by his party because of intimidation and fear. The GOP is scared, literally scared for their own safety. This is why the Trump intimidation tactics in his various court cases are effective. They intimidate witnesses. They intimidate public servants. Look what he did to those two poll workers. Yeah. So and the minions have they call with the death threats and freak people out. Yeah. Uh, it, it's it's the ripple effect of 
all that hate and bullying and intimidation. So Jordan, who again worships at the church of Donald Trump, he tries the same thing, but it doesn't work out for him. No. So uh, this idea of political intimidation is, I mean, open political intimidation of the sort that we're seeing is a really dangerous thing that occurs on the GOP side. And there's always been horse trading associated with politics. And as you suggested, Kim, the giving up of certain things or compromises to get to what you want, to get the votes you want. But this literal physical intimidation and threat, that's a real new thing that I think for the most part Trump has unleashed. And again, the Trump disciple Jim Jordan is using it. Hard to believe that he would go for another vote, although he certainly got it in him. He doesn't care. I mean, I think he's, you know, he's not someone who's shamed easily. Yeah. So, and we'll get, if there's time, we'll get some uh, thoughts from uh, uh, the great Rothman about that as well. The Mark Thompson Show. I did want to, and I will get to the Middle East. I promise you I'll get to the Middle East and that evidence. But I did want to share with you a couple of other things. Um, One of which is the latest information on students who survived the COVID shutdowns and the fact that most California students are falling short of grade level standards in math and reading. It's something we've heard from David K. Johnston over and over again, right? That that the the levels of literacy in the United States are continue to fall. Overall student scores declined in reading less than one percentage point. But more than, it's 46.7% achieving state learning standards for their grade, okay? 46.7%, what does that mean? That means that more than half of the students don't have the basic learning standard for their grade when it comes to reading. It is frightening. Now in math, there was a modest gain of just over one percentage point, 34.6% achieve state standards. Hard to believe that that, you know, like is an improvement. (laughs) So two thirds of California students are not testing at grade level in math. This is in California, you know, developed, uh, clear thinking, wide open, uh, libby lib California. I mean, we know the truth about California. It's not Libby Lib. It's Libby Lib in the cities, and it's super conservative everywhere else. I'm, but I think Libby Lib in the cities scores aren't that great either. L.A. Unified, the state's largest school system, approved a little more than a uh, than the state did as a whole in math, two percentage points, but it also started out lower and remains lower. The school system in L.A. also started out lower in reading, but fell back slightly more than the state as a whole. So there it is. These public school systems are a mess. It's just a... It's a situation that's been plagued, of course, by chronic absenteeism, by the COVID shutdowns. It's just so tough to be a kid learning stuff now. Mm -hmm. And COVID-19 was responsible for a lot of the absences that I'm talking about. But uh, the latest word on education in California is not good. The Mark Thompson Show. The strike in Hollywood continues. I know the writer's strike is over. But in Hollywood, and this is a big part of Southern California, particularly in California revenue, a 41.4% drop in production because of all of the strikes, right? That's pretty significant. Yeah, yeah pretty much half of it, right? Um, the actors and their associated guild, they are still striking, and there's actually, the talks broke down last week. Like, they're not even talking right now. Um, TV drama production dove 99% from year to year. Yeah, uh, it's not to be. Um, it's not surprised. I mean, I, I, I'm not surprised by this. Commercial production is not directly affected by the industry strikes, 
And actually, there is production in that area. Um, so despite year-to-year decline, reality shows including Basketball Wives, Red Murders of Los Angeles, Dress My Tour, and Vanderpump Rules account for more than 97% of all TV production in Q3. Yeah. I subscribe to this newsletter on the strike in Hollywood, so I'm just giving, sharing a couple of details with that. And that's really just the, you know, but, you know, they're craftspeople and wardrobe people and set designers. And this it's all of this stuff that's associated with production, and it's all shut down. So, and they don't seem close to coming to an agreement. They the talks broke down. There was too wide of a gap, right? And so they left the bargaining table. And I don't know what the status is now of whether they're going back or how they're you know going to come closer to uh, a place where they can b- negotiate from. They're too far even to, from apart to do that. Yeah, uh, it, it, we had Sam Rubin on. We'll have him on again, but he was suggesting that it's almost personal this time it, it, there's a a weird kind of personal animus on the part of the studios and the last thing i just mentioned on that is that remember these studios are all a bit different the amazon studio people even though they do some quality work they're part of a big company that doesn't really have hollywood and hollywood production at its core um you know same is true with warner brothers I mean, we may talk about max and all this stuff but the reality is that Overall, the company that is owning Warner Brothers, that's that's just a part of their business. And Disney is another example. Mm-hmm. You know, Disney has ESPN. It has the theme parks. And so we associate Disney with all this great stuff. But from a production standpoint, they can weather the storm for a while. I think they all want to get back to work. But, again, they, uh, they don't have to, a lot of them. So, uh I did get a also a the Mark Thompson show, and then I will get to what's going on in Gaza with the um, the hospital. Do some did, various dinging you for animus. I think that's true. Animus is yeah. I think it's a ding word. You're right. Very good. Well done. Tom is the keeper of the ding. We've done something on the show on the ding. I hope you are aware of it because I got some blowback. Although people, we did a two-day poll. People overwhelmingly supported the ding words. But I don't use them during uh, conversations, interviews with people in general. There are a couple of exceptions, like friends of the show. And you've heard people go, that's a ding word, even when I'm talking to them in interviews. So they clearly are okay with it. But others seem... Yeah. You know, how could you? It takes me completely out of the interview when you hit the ding word. My God. All right. Fine. So I won't do it. I, you know, um, I'm, uh, I'm conflict averse. Yeah. Oh. Everybody's a critic. Um, but the other thing there's been interest in is the uh, broken mug that, <laughs> that broke on anniversary night. So we might actually auction that because several That's people have, have made offers. It would so. be a beautiful mosaic piece. It would be. It's it's behind smashed me here. It with your iron rod. It was smashed for sure. Yeah, it's done um, for. So, uh, what I was going to do before I got to Gaza is um, I was going to give you something light and uh, fun. Can I do that? And then we begin the the grim task of sort of sifting through what's going on in Gaza. Let me give you um, a little something here. The Mark Thompson Show. It's kind of wild. Guy is jailed, needs to come up with a $10,000 bond to get out of jail. He can't do it, doesn't have that money. So he bets a parlay. A parlay in wagering is a multiple bet, meaning... If you hit one of the things in your parlay, one of your multiple bets, that's not enough. They all have to hit. How many were there, Albert? Um, I believe there was a six-team parlay. Six-team, yes. Yeah, so six. you have to have six things win to get the money. Albert, thank you. Now, 
it's hard enough to hit a two-team parlay or a three-team parlay. You can imagine four, five, insanely hard, and then a six-team parlay. Six different contests and bets have to come together. They all have to win for you to get your money. Now, if you get your money, it pays a lot of money because the chances of it happening are so low. Well, Welcome here he is. This kid, the spread. <laughs> this, right, this kid needed ten thousand dollars to post bond, and he hits a sixteen parlay. Here he is talking. Here he is making Man, the bet. Just, just bet, just bet five hundred on this ticket. Make it a parlay. <laughs> All right, I got Raiders over uh, Patriots. I got the Jets over Eagles. Bills over New York Giants. This is from jail he's doing Lions this, Kim. Tampa Bay. He's making, these are the Rams bets he was making. Cardinals. New York Liberty, the basketball team. <laughs> yeah, the WNBA. New York Liberty. Liberty. He's betting the WNBA. <laughs> yeah, make all of it a parlay. Yeah, and so that, that, that was it. He turned the $500 into his freedom, basically, Mark. He is made, it not illegal? Over, he made just to, just to, just one detail. He made thirteen thousand dollars when that hit. So he had ten thousand for the bond, and then he has three k to go party. And he's free, free, free. Isn't it illegal to bet like that? And so, is he not breaking the law from prison? I'm just wondering. Like, is, um, you know, the states that are legal, like for the FanDuel states, California, uh, uh, notoriously didn't vote for that last mm -hmm. year. So. There are states that do allow that. I'm not sure which state he's in, but um, I mean, that's pretty cool. <laughs> he got his freedom. <laughs> yeah, off of a phone yeah. call. I, and that's I, the I, second I, time I, doing it. There was another viral video. I, I can't find it, but then that's the second time. So all the degenerates on Twitter are like praising him <laughs> and they're always waiting for his picks. So, Oh, this guy has become like the oracle of sports betting, you're saying? Yeah, from prison, by the way. He has <laughs> no idea, I'm sure. His, uh, impact. From prison. He's, uh, yeah, well, why not? Um, uh, Lori, wait a minute Ooh, before I get to, the, idea, to it just might work. Yeah, do it all from prison. It's a wild idea. Look at this. Happy belated anniversary. Now, Lori is Lori and Mark live above the bar. Yeah. The Red Jack is the stop in San Francisco. There it is, the Red Jack Saloon. It's a great place to watch sports, but it's also like one of those bars that just is terrific. Great to go meet somebody. Yeah. Great to, you know, you're like, you just want to sit at the bar and shoot the, you know. Uh, happy belated anniversary. We dropped the ball. We had all of these really clever ideas for a video and just, uh, just at the, the timing. Up the timing. Yeah. yeah. We love you all very much. Next year, uh... we promise an appropriate tribute. My bad. <laughs> <laughs> My bad. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. Laura, you're awesome. Well, you can do no wrong with us, Lori. We love you. Yeah. You're a big supporter. And if you go into the Red Jack Saloon and you order a martini, a portion of that martini goes to our show. Mm -hmm. And also, Kim has a drink. It's the it's, Kimikaze. It's the Kimikaze. Yeah. So do that. And uh, I have Harry an unofficial says, drink too, Mark. It's just oh, a shot of tequila. And it just goes to your benefit. No, not to <laughs> our show. You're Thank welcome. you. I love it. Uh, Harry says, uh, here's to your martini at the Red Jack. Yeah. yeah. Now, we talked about So I'll go in there, and, uh, of course, those guys uh, who own the bar, they're asleep upstairs. And so I never – so all I did was, you know, <laughs> hang out for a while, but I missed them, my yeah. last trip to the Red Jack. But that's the story. Thank you so much, Laurie. And that $50 is what we're talking about, really generous. And yeah. thank you, Harry, for the fiver as well. Um, so appreciate it. And a, a big shout out. Big I shout out. Yeah, I'm sorry. I think it was a remiss in uh, uh, giving big you both out. big shout outs. Uh, all right. Now to a little something of what's happening in the Middle East. The Mark Thompson Show. The Arab street is alive with protests because of this Gaza hospital blast. And so is the Israeli street. And that's the other thing. And I start with what's happening on the Arab street and Israeli street, and then we'll get to John Rothman, as you know, in the next half hour. And he can comment further on it. But I start with the street. 
because a lot of the decisions that are being made right now on a diplomatic level and even on a military level, I would suggest, are pushed by what's happening on the Arab street and on the Israeli street. By that I mean you have, just as you did post 9-11, the demand to do something, but you also have the call for restraint. Those things do coexist in Israel, but the passion and emotion and the pain associated with what happened with the wanton violence perpetrated by Hamas, that is very hard to stem. And the government, which feels the heat from the street, again, from the people, how could you ever allow the vigilance that has so defined Israel to be questioned now on a level that it is? Whatever border security you had, whatever military presence you had, was so porous that all of these fighters in, over a thousand of them on the part of Hamas, could infiltrate and perpetrate this horror. So you have this, that's what's happening in Israel. You have this demand. So Netanyahu, who we know is a, you know, an autocrat wannabe, who uh, an embattled figure in Israel, not a popular guy within Israel. He's, you know, this hard right guy. He begins this campaign in Gaza. The warning to evacuate, the bombing that has already taken place. And what's happening now on the Arab street? Well, there are huge protests and anger. It was already happening. And it was, it's, by the way, happening at American universities, too. That's another story. But the support of the Palestinians. And by the way, this is perhaps a bit troubling. That support predated the actual retaliation strikes. So, you know, it's like. Can't we take a minute to at least sympathize with the Israelis and what they went through? But we're on to, you know, now a conflict that begins to unfold. And so the inflection point in all of this is the bombing of this hospital. The Gaza hospital blast blamed immediately on IDF, Israeli Defense Forces. Now... There are two things that are at odds with each other, and then I will play you the recording that was intercepted. The things that are at odds with each other are, on the one hand, Israel claims full-throatedly, we don't bomb hospitals. This is outside of what we would do. So you're thinking, well, even if I accept that as true, I mean, it's possible you could have an errant missile or something, although... Their missile strikes are certainly more accurate than a lot of them coming from the other side, from Hamas, for example. Uh, so there's that, and yet it's uh, it's not unreasonable to think that the missile came from the IDF since Israel was already bombing. So these two things kind of are coexisting, but there are also missiles being sent from Gaza into Israel, and now... The Israelis are saying, it wasn't us, uh, and we'll show you evidence that it's not us. And the evidence that's coming forward does seem to support, at least in the early going here, that Israel is not responsible for that blast. That that blast was a weapon that was not fired by the Israelis. Here is the recording that is now being uh, released, and I should say it's also alongside a lot of visual evidence, like there should be a, at the scene of the blast, some sort of sign, you can see it there, that's a shallow indentation. There should be a much, much bigger indentation if that was a missile fired. And so that's the thinking and they're looking at that kind of evidence during the investigation and uh, you know this is an investigation both going on 
by the Israelis. You may say, well, the Israelis are investigating. It doesn't mean that. They, the Israelis aren't really investigating Gaza so much because they're not there, right? They're there yet. Um, but a U.N. investigation could follow. It, so here is the recording that was intercepted. And there, you'll have to read subtitles here. And for the, I guess for the podcast audience, I'll read the subtitles for you. Yeah. And you can, this is pretty impressive if it's indeed accurate. Go ahead, Albert, run it. These are two Hamas-related fighters uh, speaking. I'm telling you, this is the first time we see a missile like this falling, is what he says. And so that's why we are saying it belongs to the Palestinian Islamic Jihad. What, says the other one? They are saying it belongs to Palestinian Islamic Jihad. Is it from us? It looks like it, says the other guy. Who says this? They are saying that the shrapnel from the missile is local shrapnel and not like Israeli shrapnel. What are you saying? This is silence. But God bless, it couldn't have found another place to explode? Never mind, yes. The cemetery behind the hospital. What? They shot it coming from the cemetery behind the hospital, and it misfired and fell on them. There's a cemetery behind it? Yes, Al-Mamandi is exactly in that compound. Said. Where is it when you enter the compound? You first enter the compound and then go, don't go toward the city, and it's on the right side of the hospital. Yes, I know it. There it is. Um... You got it, right? I know with me reading over it, maybe it was a little confusing. No, no, no. To... It was, no, it was, it? it was very clear. Yeah, it was good that you read it. Um, because I don't know if I would have understood, you know, what they were saying. But that, um, so is, Israel says they've got the proof. They put this out. But you know what it seems like? People don't care. Well, this is the they, point I was making about the street. Yeah. So the Arab street doesn't care about this. You know, you could have, uh, you could have video and audio. They'd, they'll never get the word on this, and even if they do get the word, they're going to go, this is Israeli propaganda. So for Israel, the audience is the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. So that at least the outrage, which they are experiencing now, that will be understood in a context, and they will not be having to bear responsibility for something they didn't do, which is bomb a hospital. Now, there's plenty of other stuff going on, and they'll have to own that. But the hospital bombing would appear not to, at least if you accept this as, you know, verifiably accurate, alongside the visual evidence, not to be at the feet of Israel. What we'll talk to John Rothman about is the wider conflict, not only what's happening in Gaza, but what's happening in southern Lebanon and the defense packs, that's what worries me. You could easily end up with defense packs that already exist. You could easily end up in a situation where superpowers are using the region for what will be a proxy war. It is super scary, I think. You know what? It's also confusing because to someone like me who's trying to figure all this stuff out, and I'm, I'm just getting my head around who Hamas is and who Hezbollah is. And now you've got Islamic Jihad. Like, how many of these groups are there? Who are well, all these people? Well, there and where are, are they coming ton. from? Like, what, how, yeah. There are a ton, and it's about political power. And they are, um, they're like Al-Qaeda, you know, in the sense that yeah. there are cells everywhere. Mm -hmm. The political power in Gaza is indisputably Hamas. Uh, but... Uh, you're right. They're all, that's one of the arguments against you know, the goal of rooting out Hamas and getting rid of them. You'll never root them out because they are literally all of these different little spin-off terrorist groups. Yeah. And now that you've bombed the crap out of things, these people are already pissed off as hell. Yeah. And now you're going to get them all too ready to suicide bomb, take up mm -hmm. arms, whatever. What a but, mess. But if you're in Israel, what do you do? It's a very tough spot. So we'll talk to John Rothman about it. But I thought that that evidence interesting, particularly given the fact that the president is there and the president was going to meet with all of these other Middle East leaders. And now they've all turned down that meeting after the hospital bombing. But you can see if this, again, is verifiably accurate, Israel didn't bomb the hospital. So if you're not meeting with Joe Biden because of the hospital bombing, 
you know, again, the fates have favored those elements that want to see Israel never get any kind of support from any other nation. So very tough spot for Joe Biden, too, who spoke, I thought spoke well about the um, loyalty that the Americans feel um, to Israel. But, you know, the region itself does have an issue with Palestinians, and you can't turn your back on that issue either. And so uh, Palestinians would say, hey, that's all America does is turn its back on us. You know, we've been under this kind of well, bizarre yeah. rule for for decades now. And I know it's not all about money, but today President Biden uh, came out and said that the United States will give $100 million to uh, efforts to get clean water and food and help the people uh, in the Gaza area. So I don't necessarily know if that's turning on our back on people. You no, know, that's I think a that lot I think you're absolutely help. right. That's a uh, that's huge. And again, I hope that word gets out to the Arab street. Mm -hmm. The Arab street is getting whipped up right now, and things like that sometimes never make it down to the Arab street at all. Yeah. So um, it, it's a it's a uh, it's as though the whole region is filled with kerosene and. They're just a bunch of little matches being lit. And so I just hope the whole thing doesn't become such a conflagration before things like that get to uh, make their way into the narrative. And the last thing I'll say is that there is, and this we talked about yesterday, you know, when the president went to Israel, there had to be some kind of humanitarian a connection and maybe even relief route that was going to be opened. And that is what apparently has happened, isn't it, Kim? They're going to, uh, I think the other announcement that the president made is that there will be humanitarian relief that will be uh, let into southern Gaza. I believe that that's right. Mm. Uh, but check it. I mean, that was that was advertised as the thing that they, um, um, that they won't block, block humanitarian aid going into Gaza from Egypt was the, uh, was the and there are, their trucks lined up, you know, ready to go. Yeah. So, um, what do you want to do? Go to Rothman? I think How so. Do you want to we should do okay. a supersized news. We'll just keep okay. the supersized news. Top of the hour. Smash the like button. If you would, we try to give you as much as we can with some perspective on any number of things Smash it with your iron rod. I mean, who else is giving you <laughs> the state of education in California? the situation in the Middle East, and then the six-team parlay that the guy is trying to get out of uh, prison. <laughs> I mean, come on. That's pretty strong, everybody. <laughs> Smash the like button for that. Mark Thompson Show. The Mark Thompson Show. Uh, this guy's book is uh, Into My Home. Where do I have it over here? Yeah. Icon of Evil, it's called. And when it comes to the Middle East, he has a tremendous reservoir of knowledge, and he can help give us some sort of framework with which we can deal with what's happening. Here's John Rothman, everybody. John does the podcast around the political world with John Rothman. It's a daily podcast. And what have you been saying on the podcast the last couple of days, John? Uh, well, it's been a very complicated situation. Uh, the question that we have to ask is a simple one. Does truth matter? And I want to suggest to you, and you alluded to it in your intro, Mark, that to the Arab street, Israel is the villain. That's all there is to it. There is no alternative. And so the facts don't matter. And it's true that a terrible thing happened in Gaza. It also is now self-evident and proven that it was Islamic Jihad and a misfired ro a rocket caused this huge, horrific tragedy, but it won't matter. And it was the point I tried to make last week. Uh, for that part of the Arab world, not all, but that part of the Arab world, the problem is that Israel exists at all. And that is why Hamas and its covenant is committed to the destruction of Israel. And to answer Kim's question, so is Islamic Jihad. They absolutely oppose it. And Iran, which makes no... Iran doesn't even call Israel Israel. They call it the Zionist entity. So this is a highly complex problem. 
It extends to Hezbollah in Lebanon, and you asked at the very top of the hour about uh, Lebanon. Uh, there is increased activity on the border. What is restraining Nasrallah uh, is the fact that we have the Eisenhower and the Ford sailing now off the coast with massive firepower. And that's going to be an interesting thing. And, and one more point, if I, if I might, you alluded to the question of college campuses. I spent the better part of three decades traveling and speaking on college campuses on the American presidency, the Middle East, and all the rest. I can tell you that the radicalization of the college campuses is not new. This is something that's gone on forever. What you're seeing now is an even more uh, forceful manifestation. And I don't mind people who say they support Palestinian rights. That's their right. But have you heard the people who condemn this action, condemn Israel? Have you heard them condemn Hamas? And that is the notable point that I want to make. The excuse that is being made is that it's all Israel's fault. I beg to differ. Israel's existence is what irritates the Arab world in large part. And certainly with Hamas, read their covenant. I've cited Article 7 before from the Haditha. If a Jew should hide behind a rock or a tree, let the rock or the tree cry out, there is a Jew behind me. Come and kill him. Not an Israeli, Mark, but a Jew. Well, the anti-Semitic uh, essence of all of these various organizations is uh, indisputable, uh, as, you've, as you've said. No, it, it is disputable. That's the problem. It is masked now by the concept that uh, it's Israel. And let me just point out to you, to, to call yourself a Jew hater is no longer fashionable. But the minute you say that you don't hate Jews, you just hate Zionists, or you just hate Israelis, it, all that is is a mask for modern Jew hatred. And, and I, I, I know it's a harsh thing to say, but it's true. I like that you speak on this because I think that what may be lost in all of this also is that Israel was created, and I was making this point the other day, in the shadow of the Holocaust, but because there was anti-Semitism that was infecting life everywhere, all through Europe, all, anywhere the Jewish people were. And so that's how Israel, um, it was sort of a an effort on the part of the world. I mean, it was it was led by you know Zionist uh, l lobbyists, you know, essentially lobbying the rest of the world, trying to make it happen um, to get the Jews a place where they could be safe. Yeah, but you understand, Mark, and it's very important. Zionism was a vital, vibrant movement before the Holocaust. That the Zionist movement claimed that Jews, like any other nation, were entitled to a homeland, a place of their own. Had there been no Holocaust, there still would have been a Zionist movement. But there, there might not have been. Move. There, but John, would you concede there might not? This is interesting. I'm asking you. I really just don't yeah. know. You, you do. Um, I, I always assumed that had there been no Holocaust, the Zionist movement, while it might have been out there, they, the clarion call wouldn't have been heard the way it was. No, quite the contrary. Uh, the Zionist movement and the right of the Jews to a homeland was recognized in the Balfour Declaration. It was uh, also, uh, which was 1917 also by the League of Nations mandate over Palestine, uh, which uh, the, the League of Nations gave that mandate to the British uh, in the 1920s. It was a recognized movement. What Hitler did was convince the world of something that is, well, so tragic. Without a homeland, the Jews were defenseless. The borders of the world closed to the Jews. They had no place to go. And I know that Joe Biden has cited Golda Meir's comment uh, this is our home. We're, we're, we're not going anywhere. Yeah, I heard that, that today also. And that, by the way, is the same statement made by an Israeli general who probably doesn't know that Golda Meir said it. The uh, questions I get, and I want to sort of offer them up to you. Um, One of them I forwarded to you, by the way. I hope you saw it. Oh, uh, you did. Yeah, you did. What what was that one was uh, what related to? Uh, do you recall it? I can. That was the question about Jordan. And oh, yeah. why uh, won't Jordan or Syria or Egypt open their borders? And well, the particularly is, Jordan, I think, for, yeah. the re for its proximity. Go ahead. Yeah. Remember that that already 80% of the population of Jordan is Palestinian. Jordan is an artificial state created when Winston Churchill drew a line on a map. And the Hashemites want to keep Jordan Hashemite. 
it's not called the Palestinian state of Jordan. It's called the Hashemite kingdom of Jordan. And so they don't want refugees. The same thing, by the way, applies with Egypt right now with Rafa. Why aren't they opening up their borders? Why aren't they letting them in? Because the Egyptians do not want the Muslim Brotherhood, Hamas, back in Egypt in force. I mean, it's a sad, tragic moment. This is exactly right, but it creates a situation for Israel that's even more problematic. Uh, the because you you're dealing with Gaza, and it's the last thing you want is to have to administer to Gaza. You know, you have to play events after you finish this, right, John Rothman? After you've finished rooting out Hamas, however, whatever that means. I mean, going, you know, I think they really do want to root out Hamas. Yeah. Remember, uh, remember, after you've decapitated yeah. Hamas, you have to deal with Gaza. Uh, you yeah, have to, me, there has to be a way to manage it, administer it, and they don't want to occupy Gaza. The no, Israelis. of course not. Let me explain. Gaza was occupied by Egypt in 1948. And the Egyptians controlled Gaza. They had a governor general there. They had their military there. And then in 1956, there was a war, and Israel took Gaza. And then the world said, give Gaza back to Egypt, and we'll make sure the borders are quiet. And Israel was concerned, but they did it. And then in 1967, Israel took Gaza in the Six-Day War. And they held Gaza. And finally, Ariel Sharon, the former uh, prime minister of Israel, uh, decided while he was prime minister to say to the Palestinians, here, take Gaza. Uh, do with it what you will. And I want to differentiate something. The Palestinian Authority and Hamas. In a, an election in Gaza, Hamas defeated the Palestinian Authority because the Palestinian Authority was thoroughly corrupt. And then Hamas took the Palestinian Authority people and killed them. They threw them off the tops of buildings. You can Google it and you can see it. Now Hamas controls Gaza. And the idea that Sharon had was, let Gaza become the Singapore of the Middle East. The world was prepared to give aid. They were willing to expand the Gaza port. By the way, I've been to Gaza many times, uh, and I can tell you the beaches there are spectacular. The resort possibilities were amazing. But do you know what the Palestinians did? And I'm saying now the Palestinian Authority did. When they took over Gaza, there were hothouses to grow orchids and so forth. Major industry. They destroyed the, they destroyed the hothouses. Why? Because they said they would rather see the land in flames than rebuilt by Jews. I, I, I know this is harsh. I know it's difficult. I know how horrific it is. But who will rule Gaza? I will tell you honestly. Once Gaza is out, I'm hoping that it will be like what happened after Germany and Japan were destroyed in the Second World War. That. The allies, including the Arab world, will move in, rebuild Gaza, and that a democratic government will exist, as, by the way, happened in Japan and in Germany after World War II. Out of the ashes rose something better. And I have to tell you, something better has to arise because the people of Gaza are suffering. One other point, Mark. You will note that the reason that the president had to well, the meetings were not held with uh, the three major Arab leaders, uh, Sisi of Egypt, Abbas of, uh, of uh, the Palestinian Authority, and uh, King Abdullah of Jordan, was because they canceled the meeting. It was a Palestinian decision, frankly. And, and I don't understand. If I had been Abbas, I would have wanted to meet with Biden. I would have tried to get everything I could out of Biden to rebuild what's going on. And this is a real problem because this is the this is the politics of the street. That's what I was talking about before. Yeah. They want to play the moment of rebuffing the American president for the street. You're right. In terms of the bottom line, a meeting with the president is better. But in terms of political bump, you know, you flip the American president the bird and then you, you know, take a victory lap. I want to ask you about these questions that are coming in. Uh, I want to know, says John, uh, how John feels about Israel blocking aid to the civilian victims in Gaza. You know, Israel isn't blocking aid. Yeah, I don't quite understand. Hamas is blocking the aid. No. I mean, you have to understand, the Israelis are willing to provide aid. Who is closing that opening right now? The Egyptians and the Palestinians. 
It's not the Israelis. The Israelis don't begrudge the Palestinians who live in Gaza aid and support in terms of humanitarian aid. Well, John, the the, way, the, the, John, who, to be who, fair, they, yeah. they don't that that border, that southern border, is not open for for any reason, humanitarian aid or other on the Israeli side. No, either. but it has been. Oh, you're saying yeah, in the past it, it has, has been. been. Okay. Why is it closed now? It's closed now because of terror. Sure, Please, no, I get it. Let now. us right. remember. It's hard to remember things. What happened less than two weeks ago in Gaza, and in northern and in 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 in, in southern Israel, that border was open. People were coming through. Uh, I mean, do you understand? Yeah. To be fair, you're allowed to close the border after uh, after you've just been infiltrated and in absolutely your your inhabitants slaughtered. Uh, John, please comment. Says uh, Champagne on why Palestinians are kicked out of their homes. What's up with that? The question is about Palestinians being removed from their homes. Why were they removed from their homes, uh, particularly in Gaza? Because of terror. Uh, the Israelis have gone in and they're determined to root out the terror. If you're asking about the general policy, this was a policy established by the British, which said, if you're using a house for terror, you should blow up the house. Uh, I don't happen to agree necessarily with that policy, but the Israelis have used great restraint. They're not out. May I, let me put it bluntly. If the Israelis wanted to exterminate the Palestinians, they could have done it. They have the power to do it. They've always had the power to do it, but they haven't. Instead, what do they do? They conclude the Oslo Agreement. Sharon returns Gaza uh, to uh, the Palestinian Authority. Uh, I mean, how far do you bend until you break? And what has happened in Israel, very bluntly, is what happened 10 days ago, it snapped everything. The Israelis said enough is enough. I mean, I, I mean, this is something people have to understand. And I want to go to something Kim said several weeks ago. Isn't there some reconciliation? Isn't there some way? Believe me, everything has been tried. But when you have Hamas, which says we will never accept the right of Israel to exist, or for that matter, Jews, I mean, what do you do? You, yeah, in order to make peace with your enemy, you have to have someone to talk to. And that that's an example is Egypt and Israel. Uh, an example is Jordan and Israel. Yeah, you an need a partner in of, peace for sure. Yeah, yeah. that's true. Go ahead, Kim. But this is where, and this is, a, I realize this is a stupid question, okay? And it comes Nothing, from, no question is stupid. No, no, no. Kim. You're going to think like the, the root of this question is based in fallacy. Kim, how are you? <laughs> Good. Thank you very much. But we know that um, you know, we talked about Israel needing a home and you talked about uh, it, be, you know, needing to ha or the, the Jewish people needing to have a home, have a have a country. But if this has been going on for so long and if there's no partner in peace and if there's always going to be danger for the Jewish people and I realize it's the Holy Land, but why this land? Isn't it wouldn't it be more peaceful and better for the Jewish country the jewish state to be somewhere else because they're just they're never going to be safe there's never going to be peace and they're always going to be in danger and at risk and i realize that's insurmountable and that people own property and land and that this is but it just seems like if i'm the person who's always being attacked who's being persecuted who's never going to feel safe in my own home or in my own country if never knowing when a rocket's coming next why do i want to live there or be there or why do the, I want that to be where the country because is because Jews have nowhere else to go that's the lesson of the Holocaust and pre-Holocaust the world shut its doors and Jews finally established a home where overwhelmingly they have been safe where their economy has boomed where they have made the major diplomatic efforts but Jews are determined to survive in Israel it, and may I make one other quick point? We have a lot of listeners I know who came from the former Soviet Union. Jews in the Soviet Union had no place to go except Israel. Yeah. And, and two million of them did. Finally, the United States opened its doors and about a million Jews came here. But after the Holocaust, the United States opened its doors. For Jews, it is a matter of survival. Now, let me be clear. The Israelis have not lost hope. No one is talking about 
the mass expulsion or murders of Palestinians. They're saying, let's find a way to live side by side. And the tragedy of the last few days was exemplified, as Mark pointed out so wisely at the opening, is that the Arab street doesn't accept Israel's right to exist as a nation. And what happens when Joe Biden, the president of the United States, comes to the Middle East and tries to forge something? The president of Egypt, the president of the Palestinian Authority, and the king of Jordan walk away. It would seem to me, if you're in that position, you ought to want that meeting. You want to make your case. And the other thing is, the simple truth is that um, Jews understand there's no place else to go. Uh, that that's that's a very simple, direct answer. Yeah, and that's sort of what I was getting at with the proliferation of anti-Semitism through history. That you know, the would you do me a favor? Europe. Would you yeah. call it what it is? It's Jew hatred. It's not anti-Semitism. Okay. It's Jew hatred, and I say that because the Arabs are Semites too. Right. That's exactly right. Um, the questions that come in, John. Here is oh, here's the follow up. I think just to get this clear. Um, this is after um, Israel barring entry of uh, water, fuel, uh, food into Gaza since Hamas's la attack last week. U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken secured an agreement with Israel Prime Minister uh, Benjamin Netanyahu. Yeah, it's, oh, so, oh, this is what John's saying. John, he's saying John Rothman, Israel was blocking aid going into Gaza. It's a fact after the attack they were because they were concerned with John. Of Obviously, we said it after the attack. They said no. Clo border closed. Can, because can I point something out, Mark? About, yeah. There was a problem of infrastructure in Gaza, and they were bringing concrete in. The Israelis were allowing concrete to come into Gaza. Was the concrete built, used for a constructive purpose? No. It was designed to build these tunnels. There, there was no construction yeah. that benefited this, the to, people. John is right about this. I mean, to be fair, you know, if you're Israel, you've just had this horror show go on, go on with this infiltration and this slaughter. I understand why you seal your border, because as John says, under the guise of humanitarian aid, a lot of bad S goes down, okay? Egypt is a better question, and that's why I'm encouraged to see that Egypt border crossing opened for humanitarian aid, and that has happened. But on the Israeli side... Wait, hold I, on. It yeah, has happened ahead. on a very limited basis. Uh, remember who ruled Egypt after Mubarak? It was the Muslim Brotherhood, the and General Sisi, who is a dictator in every sense of the word. His concern is the rise of radical Islam. And so that's the reason why the Egyptians are so careful, because if they make one slip, Sisi will be gone and the Muslim Brotherhood will be back in charge of Egypt. And who supported Hamas? The Muslim Brotherhood. It's a... Um... It's such a dark time, John. Can I, I make wanna... a suggestion? Why don't we just trade the Middle East for, uh, that is Israel, and take Hawaii. Hey, Kim, you're Hawaiian royalty. But you understand you can't do something like that. Uh, if you that, did. Yeah, it's as it, crazy as saying, like, yeah. how come the, the, the fill in the blanks can't go somewhere else? You know what I mean? I understand you, it. You know. I totally get it. But it's just, if I'm... If I'm Jewish and I'm Israeli and I'm living there and this place is a powder keg and I never feel like and you said there there had they have been safe and a good economy and whatnot, but it just feels like through my whole life, every time you turn around, there's some type of conflict in this region in this area and it n never feels like there's real peace. Like you're right. I'm thinking right, last night how thing. by yeah. how. I'm thinking That's last why night. Israel has an army. It has right. one of the most effective armies in the world. But you and constantly ask, have to fight. Yes, There's that's right. You have to fighting. fight for your... Yes, Israel has to fight to exist. And I mean, that's it, all there is to it's, it. It's exhausting. If I'm... if I, I feel but like... You, if, the, the idea, I think... Sorry to interrupt, Kim, but I think the idea underpinning all of this is wherever you move the Jews... In your There's little, gonna be trouble. they're going to be fighting for existence because there's right. so many Jew haters out there. That, that makes is sense the reality. To me. Yeah. And so, go ahead. It's not a question of moving. I get it. Yeah. The the land. Got it. I mean, everybody's got. You know, if I go back right. far enough, I've said this the other day. This depends on when you walked into this movie, mm -hmm. and you have to have seen the whole movie to right. really be able to put this in any kind of perspective. And yeah. most young people haven't seen the whole movie and 
there are a lot of biases here that are underpinned by religion, et cetera. But the true horror of, I think, yes, being Jewish in that region, it's really rough. And by the way, last no, thing, no, wait, John, wait, wait, wait. John, you'll book me up. People are leaving Israel, yeah, by the way. On, People on. are. Yeah. People are it's, scared. Okay. Do you understand it's not just that region? Do you understand that in the United States of America, security around synagogues, Jewish yeah. community centers are at record highs? Mm -hmm. And that is also something you have to think about. Well, look at what, the, what happened in the uh, in the in the Pittsburgh uh, synagogue uh, slaughter and uh, the Jew hating and slaughter that goes on all and over. Think America. about the irrationality yeah. when in the suburb of Chicago, a, a little boy Six -year -old who is a Muslim kid. is killed by someone. By the way, I just heard this this morning. Who listens to right wing radio and hears the constant barrage of anti Muslim rhetoric and who went in and killed this little boy. I mean, I don't know, you can't prevent hate, but I do want you to understand, in my mind, hatred is not sacred. The problem with Hamas and the radical Islamists is that hatred is sacred. That's what they teach their children. May I tell you quickly a story? I, When I first went to Israel in 1968, I saw the textbooks which were used in the in Egypt and in Jordan. And they would teach math. And, and let me give you one of the math problems. If you have nine Jews and you kill eight of them, how many do you have left? Mm. I actually have a book of those kinds of lessons that were taught. When you teach people to hate, what you're seeing now with, the, with this terrible business in Gaza, no matter what the truth is, they're still taught the same irrational lies. And frankly, they become part of the life and the fabric of what younger people think. It is, it, it, it's so sad, I can't even begin to explain to you the feelings that I have. Before uh, we go, can I bring yeah. up this comment We're from Sherry? Late, but yeah, go ahead. Sherry writes, and this I, I bring it up because I was really surprised to hear this too. She says, I was shocked to hear that Israelis all have safe rooms in their homes. And this kind of goes to what I was saying is, this is the way you have to think and this is the way you have to live and you never have a moment's peace. You have, uh, you have to always think, how am I going to be safe if they come and try to attack me? How am I going to have a safe room? I have to build somewhere to protect my family. I and mean, Israelis, wow. Israelis have gas masks yeah. because if you remember, when Saddam Hussein rained 39 missiles down on Israel, he had threatened to use gas. So Jews in Israel and Arabs in Israel went into safe rooms with gas masks. In the end, Saddam Hussein did not use those kinds of weapons, but that's a simple reality. You're right, Kim. It's a not a nice way to live. Right. But in Israel, they are so glad they have a haven. They have a home. They have a place they can call their own, where they can build a civilized society, where their children have educational opportunities, where, frankly, Israelis lead a relatively normal life. Well, it's a, all we, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I think you've made the point well, John. Yeah. And and of course, uh, we'll when you uh, appear with us again next week, we'll um, I'll give you all the email and the the questions that are showing up here about. We don't know, have time for questions about the dysfunctionality of the Republicans in the House of Representatives. Well, I'm telling you, you've taken all your, your all your time on the Jew hating. <laughs> I can't. I don't have time for the, the you know. There's so much of the Jew hating. So I um. Uh, we've been talking about the other Jordan. We didn't get to Jim Jordan. <laughs> so uh, You mean we uh, didn't get to the other side of the Jordan? Oh, very well done, sir. Um, love you, John Rothman. All the best. Thank, Thank you. you. We'll talk to you next week. Okay, stay Before. in touch. John Rothman. Uh, he, um, Will, and I'm chronicling many comments, just couldn't get to all of them. Albert has stepped up as a good producer should in this moment. Mm -hmm to make a decision. Albert, thank you. What would you like to do, Albert? We're going to have to push the news. Uh, we're yep, a little late okay. here again. I yeah. understand. Um, I'm excited not to push the news, but for the re <laughs> the reason we're pushing the news is uh, to pretty good. Yeah. talk to these guys about uh, a new book. So uh, let's get it on. The Mark Thompson Show. Now, uh... It's, um, do we have Nelson? Who do we have, Albert?
We have uh, Nelson and Alex both. Wow. Yeah, I think we have a, we a little two for one, Mark. Two for I one. love this. Okay, they wrote this book together. Alex DeMille and his son, um, uh, uh, his son uh, wrote this together. Uh, it's called Bloodlines. It's a new thriller. I think this is the second one in the series, though. We'll ask him about that. It's about espionage and terrorism and politics and starts with a murder, and they think it's uh, you know, kind of a Islamic uh, terrorism, and it's actually a, a whole investigation unfolds and something else. How about it for the DeMills, everybody? Yeah, look at you, too. I'm all... Nelson and Alex. Good to see you. So Alex is the younger DeMille, correct? I think so, yeah. I mean, you're both, it's very, look very close in age, but yes, okay. So, and am I right, this is your second book? That's right. Our first collaboration was The Deserter, came out in 2019. And this is the follow-up of the same characters. Right, the uh, lead character throughout, a couple of lead characters. So... What's it like, first of all, to write with your dad? <laughs> uh, it's, 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 an, it's an education. Uh, I'd never written. I, I've come from film, screenwriting, uh, film editing. So it was, it was a different, not only new to work with him, but new to write a book in the first place. So um, but I grew up with it. I uh, had some sense of, of what went into it. I didn't really understand how, how hard it was uh, going to be. But it was really, it was great. It, it gives us like an extra reason to, to talk and spend time together. So it's nice. Nelson, do you uh, write drafts and then push them to Alex, or how does it? What was your method and rhythm of writing? Yeah, we came up with an MO fairly quickly, which was Alex was going to do the heavy lifting, and uh, he's going to do the research and write the first draft and send it to me. And it worked. It's, uh, he is a screenwriter. He knew how to structure a story. He knew like you know Act One, Act Two, Act Three, and the dialogue was good because he's a screenwriter. So I said. You know, I'm going to take it easy on this, and I let him do first draft. And I became like the editor, and so I did some rewrites. Um, by this book, second book, uh, Bloodlines, he really got it down. He really made a good transition between screenwriter and novelist, which is not that easy. And, you know, it's funny because you do have to, you're continuing characters, and you have a story here that you have to agree on, right? You have to agree on plot points. You have to agree on what characters you're doing. Is that done by Alex, and uh, do you push back on it, Nelson, or is it? Do you like you know? But you come from the world of storyboarding, Alex. Do you you know how do you how do you do it? Well, yeah, with screenwriting, you kind of have to do a lot of pre-planning. You know, people a lot of people doing index cards or digital index cards of this scene, that scene. Uh, my father has been a lifelong um, uh, been been anti outline, uh, and I, I always hated doing it anyway. So it was nice to uh, not do that this time. <laughs> Uh, but what I did was for this book, Bloodlines, we, I came up with an idea, which was I want to do a murder mystery set in Berlin uh, involving the U.S. Army because our characters are U.S. Army CID agents. And uh, I just had a lot of different elements like you know, ingredients in this, this, this book I wanted to fit into it. So I wrote a proposal. Um, uh, Dad, you edited the proposal. So we kind of we definitely had shared a, a vision of the, the, the big picture yeah. and then shared they gave that to the publisher. Yeah. They said, go ahead. Um, and then a lot of the more granular stuff I kind of decided on my own and then he'd either think it was a good idea or think it was a bad idea and we kind of go as, as we went. Yeah. yeah. And this is, uh, you know, I should say to make this book a little more relevant to what's happening, uh, Alex did a lot of research on you know, um, Arab terrorist groups, Islamic terrorist groups. Um, and there's a lot of that in the book because the book is set in Germany, set specifically in Berlin. In a um, in a neighborhood that's uh, mostly populated by uh, refugees from the Middle East, and this is where the murder of an American CIA CID agent takes place. So the suspicion right away falls on the uh, Arab and Muslim community, and that's a, a large part of the book. And I learned a lot because he did the research, and I learned a lot about the different groups within these movements and. Yeah, Hezbollah, Hamas, and the whole thing. So Yeah, I was going to ask you about the research because you had referenced it before. So is that primarily where your research was? I would think that you'd have to do some research on military stuff and, you know, because the, the you do deal with military investigators and, you know, special ops kind of people. What was your research mostly concerned with? Uh, well, my father... It was it was in the army and in Vietnam. So some of that was you know I, I would write stuff knowing that I had a, had a bit of a safety net if I'm just making something up about the army and um, you know he he would step in if something kind of felt wrong or sounded wrong. 
then obviously having to do some research about how things have changed and how the modern army works. Um, but honestly, a part of the interesting thing is I ask myself, what is what kind of uh, power do would an army CID agent have in Berlin for this kind of murder? And the answer was almost none. So that was an immediate uh, uh, kind of point of tension that like, we have our, our characters butt up against. And that's a lot of the, the kind of drama in the story comes into them basically breaking every rule as they come across it. So that was kind of fun. But then the other thing was, yeah, what are all the different communities in this part of Berlin? Um, you know, what, what is the, the German security services suspicions about, you know, mosques and community centers, you know, who, who's funding what, what are the different agendas? And it's been, it was interesting. Um, I talked to a couple of reporters who live in Berlin still, and I, we both been about four times. So we had a, a general idea of the cityscape. The, uh, reviews on the book very strong and one of the things that's said is like the last part of the book the last third of the book just it it it, it moves like a bullet train it's so amazing and this is a thriller so i'm wondering if you've uh, clearly your publisher wanted a second book are you thinking you know about this uh, you know might it be transferable to the screen you're the big screen guy alex demille yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, everything, you know, has been on standstill because of the strikes. And obviously the writer strikes over now. Um, and uh, we've, you know, there's been rumblings of TV interest. I feel like everybody is talking TV these days instead of feature film. Uh, yeah, like a series. So the, everything's, uh, they serialize everything now. Well, right? series. I mean, it's a, it's a big book. Um, it's, there's a lot. There's a, there's a lot of plot. A lot of, you know, there's the main characters. There's lots of, I think, interesting uh, supporting characters, so I could easily see it kind of being fleshed out to a, it's like a ten hour, eight hour, ten hour, sure, serialized story. Yeah. Uh, and then finally, I have to ask you: the Demille name uh, mm -hmm. occupies a certain uh, level of reverence within the entertainment and film community. Did you? Uh, I assume you're not related to Cecil B. Demille, Nelson Demille, are you? Well, I, sometimes I say yes. <laughs> But, uh, but yeah, the answer is no. He was, he was actually Dutch. His name is Demo. Uh, Demo. I'm the oh, real, is that uh, right? Wow. Uh, my ancestry is called French. That uh, is terrific I, knowledge. I did not know that. Yeah, he was D E M I L, but it doesn't sound good, so he decided to make it Demel. Wow, that is terrific knowledge. <laughs> um, Alex, you know. I would have played up that DeMille thing big time in Hollywood. Did you ever try that, Alex? I mean, yeah, uh... yeah definitely. <laughs> <laughs> it depended. It depended. Like you know, it was, is this a casual conversation where I can lie and get away with it, or is this like a, a meeting where they're going to check up on it? You know? <laughs> I see. Yeah, yeah. The internet really has uh, has hurt in in many ways uh, that way. Um, William says, Nelson, I really enjoy your books. Um, there you go. From uh, from our audience and um i'm just looking uh the deserter somebody else is saying Lori says the deserter she is in the process of listening on audible so okay. and this is uh bloodlines is also on audible correct yes scott brick is a narrator he's been narrating most of my books the last 20 years of that he's an actor in la i should mention too more we're on the road right now we're on publicity tour we're both uh, New York, Alex is Brooklyn, I'm Long Island, but we are right now on Vero Beach on, in the middle of a publicity tour. And today we're waiting for a word from our publisher to see where uh, Bloodlines has landed on the New York Times bestseller list. Uh, this is the day they will tell us. And we're, we're hoping for number one, which is not too unreasonable. Our last book, The Deserter, actually debuted at number three which is not bad for a co-authored book with a new series and new characters. So we're, we're pushing for number one today, and we want everybody out there to, <laughs> to send good, good karma and good Yeah, thought. and buy the book. But yeah, well, we'll, we'll, we'll right. await that word as well. Hey, Nelson, uh, last thing, you know, with your background as a Vietnam vet, and uh, how did you segue out of that world? I mean, I always associated with that with such a crucible of emotion and uh, and issues and, you know, conflicts. I mean, I'm talking about emotional conflicts. How did you segue out of that into this uh, rich world of writing? You know, I think a lot of men, um, <clears throat> maybe educated men, you know, come back from war, especially if you've been in combat, and you have a story you want to tell. And that's really what compelled me into writing. I was a you know, great reader in high school and college. And I read Norman Mailer and James Jones. I read all the great World War II 
literature and um, you know, even Hemingway, World War One. And you know, I said, well, you know, I thought in the back of my mind, this is. But then when I actually, you know, got out of college and I went to the army and I did, uh, you know, experience combat, I came back with, you know, the story I wanted to tell, the Great American War novel. Every I think every educated soldier wants to write that one. And that's what got me into the writing process. I knew people in the business. Living in New York, you don't know people in the publishing business. And I reached out to some people and some uh, veterans who were I think, also coming back about the same time I was from their service. And uh, that's how I became a writer. I think without Vietnam, I would not have become a writer. Wow, is that right? Yeah, that's yeah. extraordinary. That gave you the, the story to tell that, that you felt compelled to tell. What is it, Kim? I just, I wondered, I, you've had so many best New York Times list bestsellers, and I was fascinated by something Alex said, which is that you're not a fan of the the outline. Does that mean that when you sit down to write a book, you have no idea where the story's going to lead you? Mm -hmm. You just kind of go on a path? Or have you kind of planned out in your mind, you know, the conflict, the resolution, the end? Do you know where you're headed? Or is it, are you on a journey? Mm -hmm. Wow, that's a tough one. We don't let, let my son take that. <laughs> so, I mean, I think for I would I would assume in in, in my father's case, it might depend on the book. But the, for Bloodlines, it's a murder mystery. Um, the, the the who, of course, but also the why is the is the big question hanging over it. So starting the book, um, I knew the why. I think I had to, or else we, the, even the the the, the what, we, what we pitched the publisher when the wouldn't have had enough, enough substance to say this is what it's really about. So yeah, I had point A and had point Z. Um, and that was honestly kind of it. And then for me, I just, I was lucky or whatever, however my brain works, whenever I was writing, I, I felt like in my head, I'm three chapters ahead, but never more than that, yeah. which is good because you don't, you don't end up running into a wall, but you're also kind of on the journey too. And you're allowing yourself to have these, uh, you know, have these thoughts that, that can kind of send the, the story in one direction or another. So I, I mean, outlining, it works for some people. It just, for me, it's, it can feel kind of stifling because the way you think while you're writing versus the way you think when you're trying to do this bird's eye thing, it's just mm -hmm. two different processes. Yeah. Well, congratulations on getting yeah. it done. It's really, really uh, cool to see you guys work together and collab on this thing that looks like it's uh, gonna be really yeah. something significant. Bloodlines is out. Pick it up. You can pick up the audio book or the, the script for the audio book, as I like to put it. Uh, it's the, <laughs> the actual book. Uh, Nelson, so great to meet you. And Alex, you too. Congratulations. And I look forward to seeing your name, if not atop, toward the top of the New York Times bestseller list. Thank good you, thank you, good luck with Bloodlines, thank man. You. Come back and visit. See you guys. Yeah. Wow. The Mark Thompson Show. Uh, they've got to do that. Um, you know, they do the promotional tour, but, uh, yeah. you know, Nelson's no stranger to that. He's eight times he's been on that New York Times bestseller list. I know. He's the, he's the real deal. And I love that he and his son have collaborated this there's way. There's never been the, anything like this. There's never been anything like Bloodlines is the name of the book. Uh, authors Nelson of and Alex DeMille. It's kind of my kind of book. I love a good thriller, you know, a good mystery, a good thriller. So I'm a little excited about this one. Well, Kim, uh, you are someone who has pushed her news to accommodate various <laughs> conversation today. How are you? And uh, we appreciate that. Um, it's time for a supersized newscast, though, isn't it, Albert? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah, we're due. So we have a we have a couple to combine here and including the third one at the bottom. So this might be a little <laughs> Albert, thank you. This might yeah. be a real segment of, of, of the show. This is a real thing. Right here, yeah. This is cool. I'm not going anywhere. We'll uh we'll all check it out together. So uh, smash the like button like a boss smash if you would while you're here. Your iron rod. Cost you nothing. Give it us a thumbs up. Appreciate all the ways you share the show. If you see a segment, David K. Johnson or Rothman or whomever, if you share that to Facebook. That helps get us people looking in for the first time, people subscribing. These are all things that help the show. And I really appreciate, didn't mention at all yesterday, and I'll mention just once today, we are crowdfunded. I appreciate everybody who steps up, super stickers, super chats, and also on an ongoing basis, part of our PayPal and Patreon community. If you want to be part of that community, and some of you have upped your support, you're already 
PayPal members or Patreon members. What? And you've actually gone, you know, you've you've upped your support in some way on a monthly basis. Uh, I got a few of those for the anniversary. So again, if you want to be part of that community, it's themarkthompsonshow.com. Go to themarkthompsonshow.com, click Patreon or PayPal, and those are hot links that'll take you right to either of those places, and you can uh, join the community of people who support us. So truly appreciate it. All right, Kim's News, as we continue. Mark Thompson Show. The Mark Thompson Show. On the Mark Thompson Show, I'm Kim McAllister. This report is sponsored by Tanuta Vineyards. And that's right. Let's start, though, uh, with Jim Jordan, because it's not really looking good for the Mr. Jordan. Uh, there's still no elected Speaker of the House. Ohio Congressman Jim Jordan failing to get the 217 votes necessary to win the top job in the chamber during a second vote today. The House remains leaderless as Congress must act to fund the government before the mid-November uh, deadline and as wars are raging in the Mideast and in the Ukraine. And again, the House is in recess and the people's business not being done. You know, when Jordan didn't get the vote the first time, he was a petulant, adolescent a-hole of the sort <laughs> that you knew he was, where he's screaming as he goes, out, America wants me, America wants me. A... This guy... No. There's no bottom to him. He's an absolute pile of dung. I'm so glad that he <laughs> is getting repudiated in the way he is. And there are a couple of ding words and all of that. There was a million ding yeah. words in there. That was like a dingapalooza is what that was. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's go, sadly, to what's happening in the Middle East. The Israel-Hamas war now in its 12th day. So far, more than 4,800 people have been killed total in Gaza and Israel, and protests have broken out across the Middle East after the explosion at a hospital in Gaza killed as many as 500 people. The estimates are kind of all over the map between 50 and 500, Al Jazeera reporting 500. And thousands of protesters have descended upon the United States Embassy in Lebanon. Uh, this is the demonstrations in reaction to the explosion in the ho at the hospital in Gaza. The Palestinian Health Ministry has blamed Israel for the bombing. Israel's denied any involvement. You heard uh, Mark talk about the what the Israel's proof earlier about what their systems show that it was not uh, an Israeli rocket, but one from the Islamic Jihad movement, which is a group closely aligned with Hamas. So a lot of discrepancy as to who's responsible and who's to blame for this. A U.S. defense official says two attack drones thought to be targeting American forces were shot down in Iraq. U.S. embassies have been at the center of protests in several Middle Eastern countries connected to the war between Israel and Hamas. The official said no one sustained any injuries as a result, but it's not clear who launched these drones or how they were shot down. So very interesting what's happening here. There is something going on at airports in France. As a matter of fact, as many as six airports closed because of threats. There's a picture of the uh, emptied out and one of the emptied out airports in France. They were evacuated today because of security concerns. Bouvet Airport near Paris, I hope I said that right, one of the eight airports evacuated, said it was responding to an anonymous threat received by several French hubs. Later said it was beginning to reopen. The Palace of Versailles also evacuated visitors for the third time in a week because of a suspicious item. According to its website, the Louvre in Paris also closed Saturday for security reasons, but reopened Sunday. There's never been Sunday. anything like this. Yeah, so there was a knife attack at a school in the north of France, and so France has raised its security alert level to the highest possible is what's happening right now. Very interesting. Gosh, wow. that is just brutal. I mean, it's just, yeah. It's like the tensions are escalating everywhere, right? Yeah, exactly I right. mean, you can't turn around without there being some type of security threat or someone being at risk of something. It's happening in the world. I don't know. Um, 
let's talk about this story. I uh, don't know if I have a photo for this one, but this is jury selection beginning Friday in the first trial connected to alleged attempts to overturn the results of Georgia's 2020 election. That's after Fulton County Superior Court Judge Scott McAfee denied motions yesterday to toss out charges against Kenneth Chesborough and Sidney Powell, who both requested speedy trials after indictments were handed down to nearly 20 people, including former President Trump. The trial trial of Chesborough and Powell is expected to take about five months. And again, the jury selection begins on Friday. Joran Vandersloot, remember him connected to the uh, Natalie Holloway disappearance? Yeah, well, he's finally now admitting to killing her. This is new information. Uh, this came out today. There's a picture of Joran Vandersloot. He has admitted to killing Natalie Holloway after she refused his sexual advances. Holloway's family said today that Vandersloot finally confessed that he killed Natalie. He described when and how he killed her. And he said after killing her on the beach in Aruba, he put her into the water. And that was the last time he ever saw her. 18-year-old Natalie Holloway was reported missing in 2005 while celebrating her high school graduation on a trip to Aruba. Vandersloot was recently extradited to the United States from Peru to face wire fraud and extortion charges for offering to sell the location of Holloway's body to her mother. So he plead, pled guilty to the fraud and extortion charges as part of the plea deal. He had to come forward with information about the killing. As well. You know, it's uh, this morning, Courtney comes running in with that news mm -hmm. you know, because that's her beat, you know. Yeah. And um, I had to be reminded because it's so not my beat. <laughs> exactly. I remember the case, but she said, what do you remember? We talked about it on your show. So she's going to follow up, you know, with some oh, details good. on Monday. Well, so. I'm sure we'll have more details by the time Monday rolls around, which will be really, you know, I think a lot of this is a case that garnered worldwide attention. And so a lot of people have been wondering, it's a mystery. What happened to her? Where is she? Why has she never been found? Why do we not have information? And finally, yeah, it is. Finally, uh, we get something, you know, <laughs> he seems nice, right? Uh, so it's nice to have some closure, I guess you could say, even though what happened to her is really horrible. Let's go to San Francisco. The San Francisco Board of Supervisors is voting to approve a ban on private armed security guards from drawing their guns to protect property. This legislation prohibits firearms from being used to stop shoplifters. It was submitted in response to the killing of Banco Brown at a Market Street Walgreens in late April. Remember that case? And the city's police code allows security guards to draw their guns in response to an actual threat to people, as well as in the defense of property. Brown was a transgender, homeless black man that was unarmed when he was shot and killed, measure now going to Mayor London Breed, who could still veto it. So we'll see how it works out. It is, you know, we had an earthquake this morning in, uh, in the East Bay near Isleton. It was a 4.1. And it's also tomorrow, Great Shakeout Day. At 1019 in the morning, the Great Shakeout encourages everyone to prepare for an earthquake. During the earthquake drill, most people will practice how they will drop, cover, hold on during such an event. It takes about a minute or so. Some schools or businesses might have some more extensive drills. And a text reminder will be sent to any cell phone with the Shake app installed. You can register for the drill at shakeout.org and the website has details on how you can prepare food and water and make it on your own for up to two weeks. So there you go. And you're welcome on this next story for not showing you what is actually happening at the DMZ in Fresno, a DMV in Fresno. Uh, so I'll just give you a picture of a cute rat. How about that? <laughs> Some Fresno Aww. DMV workers say they're getting sick from the stench of dead rodents at work. The Manchester Mall DMV office has been plagued by an infestation for years. Now workers say 
the dead poisoned rodents are being allowed to collect in the ceiling and other places and the smell there is overwhelming. Employees working on site say it's going to take more than just installing scent bags hung from the ceiling, which they're trying to do. The problem is being blamed on construction happening at the mall. Workers uh, want immediate action if they're being required to return to work. Management says they've hired the best company available to deal with this problem, but I guess this rodent situation is really untenable. Employees at Roblox are being told... Untenable. Yes, go ahead. Thank you. I'll take a ding. Uh, Employees at Roblox are being told, you guys have to come back into the office three days a week or take this severance package because you're out. The CEO, David Bazuki, detailing the company's return to office plans on Tuesday. In May of 2022, Roblox told workers they may choose to primarily work remotely. My how times have changed. Hmm. Families coughed up large sums saved during the pandemic to attend live events and parks this year, triggering something that economists are calling the, uh, it's called funflation. I'm all for some funflation. I mean, Mm. why not, right? What is it? What is it? It's funflation. (laughs) What does it mean? (laughs) It means you save your money. It costs more to have fun? Or yeah, no. you're gonna oh. you, you're gonna save save your money. You're gonna go have some fun. I was trying to get that picture of the roller coaster up. Americans oh. were on track to spend ninety five billion dollars this year on tickets to spectator amusements. They include movies, live entertainment, sporting event, events, all according to the Bureau of Economic uh, Analysis. So yeah, people are paying a lot more. And they're paying a lot of the money that they saved during the pandemic in order to go to live events and parks. And it's, oh, it's called fantastic. funflation. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, I mm-hmm. guess it... Uh, the live events, by the way, are super expensive. So I'm not surprised that people have to save their money to go to them. I mean, it's crazy, yeah. you know. But uh, Talk about the Taylor Swift concert. Man. Yeah, that's... Uh, straight up right in, no problem. Yeah, you got the money. It's straight up right in. Um, what we know about casinos is that they are also fun. However, the first strike is happening at a Detroit casino. Uh, Casino workers walked off the job yesterday. They failed to come to terms on a new contract. Every day of the strike, casinos are estimated to lose a combined three and a half million dollars in revenue. So this is a very expensive strike in Detroit. And I think at least three casinos are involved in this one. So. Um, yeah, I told uh, you yesterday the story yeah. of the guy who got drunk, and he thinks there was something put into his drink, and he's suing the MGM for half a million dollars. Remember that was uh, yeah quite the story. Right. Yeah, it was the story. And I will just say um, very briefly. I know you don't like the days, but today's chocolate cupcake day. So now again, just, uh, uh, chocolate cupcake there. does not need a day. I mean, uh, <laughs> people love chocolate cup cupcakes already. It needs you don't a day. need to have it a always, day. No. Again, uh, older dogs that need to be adopted, they need a day, okay? The whales need a day. The chocolate cupcakes do not need a day. I That's think that all you're I'm wrong. trying to say. Why you're absolutely yelling? incorrect. They do need a day, and it is today. <laughs> it's Good a chocolate day, cupcake sir. day. Oh, it's a day right. to celebrate well. yourself at the chocolate cupcake. Morning. Did you, okay. did you ever watch the um, the show The Office? Oh, I love The Office, yeah. Well, the showrunner of this comedy series is now talking about a reboot. Greg Daniels said in an interview with the entertainment news site Collider that it's very speculative. He said it's cool that fans are interested in bringing back the workplace sitcom, but he only said when there's something to announce, they'll definitely announce it. So is there a reboot coming? Eh, We don't know. No. The news is it might be we everything old is new again. There's a reboot of Frasier. There's a reboot. Yeah. What are they, just the reboots alone, Albert. You should get the. Um, uh, I don't know what they. Google it. Uh, you could check them. Maybe someone in the audience will. Do. I know Frasier's very high profile. Um, and what I do you feel think of the reboot? Maybe friends. The, friends. Friends. Oh, they, oh, they haven't rebooted Friends yet. I don't think. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I know what know. I was thinking. Seinfeld. They're talking, hinting yeah. that they're going mm-hmm. to do. Another episode, like a special two-hour episode of Seinfeld. Yeah. So that's being talked about as well by I think Jerry it was Seinfeld to redo the ending because I think Jerry was unhappy with it. I think that was the the news. Right. I think that you're right. I think it was in re- in relation to that. Yeah. Um, so this. Go ahead. The Fraser reboot is awful, says uh, Tom. Yeah. <laughs> 
it has gotten sort of um, bad reviews, if I can. Mm. Mm. And that's what kind of makes me feel like they should just leave it alone. Once it's done, it's done. You can't go back. You know? Yeah, I mean, I guess when they're coming to you with a truckload of money, which I'm sure is what they're doing with Greg Daniels, who is the showrunner on The Office, he's like, all right, maybe I'll take a shot at it. <laughs> they tried to My do kid that needs with the, to go to school, so. They tried to do it with the Gilmore Girls, too, and it was just boo bad. Oh, yeah. This report is sponsored by Tenuta Vineyards. Tenuta. Yes, they are amazing people. And yes, they have a 10% off discount just for the Mark Thompson Show listener. That would be you. 10% off across the board. They've got the Why Are You Yelling Red? I have it in my hand right here. They so have good. the Why are you um, yelling? Yeah, they have the Why Are You Yelling? Uh, the, Why Are You Yelling Red? That's right. And then they have the white, which is the Hey, which one of you is Mark hey, Thompson? Pinot Mark Grigio. Thompson? Yeah. These wines are amazing. Um, you can get ten percent off of the wine. You can also get ten percent off of events that they have coming up, like the Grape Stomps. And there are still dates available for the Grape Stomps. So all you have to do is call Rich at Chinuda for pricing and information, and then you have to say. Smash it with your iron rod. And oh, that's how you get yeah. the ten percent off. Say that. That's how yeah, you get, get your discount. Smash it mm. with your iron yeah. rod. Give mm. it a little oomph. The uh, phone number is nine two five six nine nine forty five seventy six nine two five six nine nine forty five seventy six and enjoy your wine from Tenuta Vineyards. Love I'm it. Kim McAllister. This is the Mark Thompson Show. The Mark Thompson Show. Who's Mark Thompson? Feels great, baby. Let me kick down the door and talk to my cheap sons and daughters. No context will suffice to explain the hurt and anguish caused by my words. I apologize to all who have been hurt. I stand corrected. I misspoke. My words upset so many people. And I wanted to apologize to the Asian community, the Asian American community. God bless America. The end. There's never been anything like this. Do I hit it long? Is Trump strong? Huh? Who is having that conversation? It's fantastic. That's not fake. That's real. The science is ridiculous. How would you handle this? We could try ignoring it, sir. If you get it in order, you get extra points. Listen to me. I don't want to hear you. You cannot say you love your country. Where are my weed smokers at? This is a word from the Lord, and he's not happy. There is no defense for my conduct. It was wrong, it was stupid, and I'm trying to be a better person. Don't ever use that word. You get nothing! What's a guilty pleasure to do that? Seriously, what the f***? What up, everybody? Welcome. If you have missed any of the show, it's available to be... Take it in. You can watch it. You can listen. We're across all major podcast platforms. In fact, yesterday. We're a big deal. We had to get uh, help from uh, Kim's family to get our podcast yeah. up because. What? Uh, yeah. A, a whole bunch of different variables came yeah. together to prevent us from doing out. it the way we normally do it. And we were panicked. And mm -hmm. so anyway, we uh, it takes a village often some days. What the so hell is going on in the United States of America? Exactly. Ron gets it. By the way, I spoke with Ron last night. Oh. It, his, it was his birthday. And so I called him for his birthday. So I talked to Ron and Jan last night yeah. and had a great conversation with him. A lot of laughs. Really enjoyed it. And uh, he had a great birthday. And I'm going down to see him probably in... Uh, middle of November, just for the day, so it won't take any time away from the show. But uh, I'm looking forward to seeing him. He sounded really good. You know, good. he's obviously had some physical challenges, but he is funny as hell and, mm -hmm. you know, is still very much with it. So um, a really uh, cool conversation I had with uh, with Ron Owens. And um, 
Albert, I... The Mark Thompson Show. I do have a few things on my plate here that I'd like to share. I'm wondering if I should quickly go to the chat, be on the reboots, people had opinions. Oh. And uh, the uh, the Frasier reboot is awful, says uh, Tom. <laughs> um, just because it's a reboot doesn't mean it's good. There are enough shows, no more reboots. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's kind of like the superhero thing too. Like, how many times do we need to watch a different Superman, a, a different like uh, Spider Man, different Batman? Like, yeah. the reboots are yeah, no, no more reboots. No new ideas, says Daniel Martin. It is true. Mm. Well, you, it's easier to sell something that was successful. So if you can get, hey, I've got Kelsey Grammer, and I've got you know a couple of other key players, and you know, Frazier's son or Roz's son. That's how this this stuff works. The only reboot that is good is uh, Cobra Kai. See, <laughs> Phineas likes Cobra Kai, which is a Karate Kid kind of reboot. I wouldn't know if it's a reboot as much as it is continuation of some kind, right? Sort of spinoff might be the words. Um, K. Joe eight ten reboot, please. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Uh, by the way, I saw a reference to Pat Thurston, who will join us in the next month or so. She's got a lot of stuff going on. So we'll get we'll corral her before too long. Reboot the Republican Party, says Luis. Wow. Also, I got an angry. I uh, you know I love angry. I love angry. It's just a thing where angry always feels as though there's a righteous indignation to it. Mm. You know, like how dare you or why do you or can't you stop? So uh, let me send. Uh, let me see if Something I can find it. Nothing wrong with a little it. complaint, you know. Sometimes. Oh, I love. Uh, well, I love them. You know. I, you know. I go right with them. I steer right into the skid. Not um, everybody's always happy. A lot of people sending me the hospital stuff from Gaza. Yeah. Um, let me see if I, I think I put it aside. The um, uh, no. Anyway, I'm sorry. I can't remember who you are and find your actual comment. But there was something about. How you hate, and you'll appreciate this, uh, Albert, this person hates the Trump drop, which has oh. uh, never been anything like this. Why? The it's person pretty, says, never been anything anything like this. this is no. from memory. I don't want to, here it is, here it is, from John. Will you please, 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 Albert, this is three pleases, mm. please. Please, please. No, no, no. Stop quoting <laughs> Trump saying there's never been anything like this. Why do you need to focus on Trump, Albert? Why are you yelling? <laughs> He's supposed to be far back in our mind. Why don't you get a clue? Wow. Oh, that's there's never been anything Day, like sir. this. Man, that, why don't you get a clue is a tough way to... Uh, yeah. To end a little message, John. That's a very yeah, I just impressive. Sure it was this one, right? This There's drop. never been anything like this. <laughs> <And now he's, laughs> Albert is trolling John now. Wow. Um, yeah, There's well, never been anything like this. Sorry, yeah. 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 Not a yeah. sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Don't talk to me that way. <laughs> there is a. There's a lot of. Uh, yeah, a lot of. I'm getting that you guys don't like Trump that much. I think I'm the most honest human being, perhaps, that God ever created. No, no, no. There seems to be considerable agreement on uh, the anti-Trump camp. But, um, uh, Albert, I will caution you again. When warned that something is annoying you and something is outrageous and how come you keep playing you know, the Trump drops. Like I did everything right, and they indicted me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he feels challenged by that, John. I'm sorry. It's not my choice. I'm with you. I just as soon get rid of all the Trump drops. But Albert is committed to it, and he's the producer of the show. I don't know what to say. So, Albert, I, thank you. I have to ride with what he's got. Uh, Albert, I have law and disorder. I have a brief law and disorder, but it's kind of cute, kind of sweet, kind of juicy. I could do a quick law and disorder, and then I could do a story from the sky. Are you good with that? Yeah. I love that. I love that. And, and again, there's never been want... anything like this. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> if you want Gaza, you want analysis, you want my summary, my takes, I suggest you get the first half hour. If you want the Rothman 
go for the second half hour, and then um, there's a lot of Gaza in the uh, in the first hour of this show. Um, we're watching it, and also there's some Jim Jordan. We're watching that as well. But for now, as you know, the house is in recess, as Kim was saying. So just to update you on the fact that we're watching all of these things. So um, I'm sorry. Do we want Law and Disorder first, Albert? Yep, Law and Disorder. Got a little juicy story out of Law and Disorder. In the criminal justice system, the people... Pimps, addicts, thieves, bums, winos, girls who can't keep an address, and men who don't care... ...are represented by two separate yet equally important groups. A cop, a flatfoot, a bull, a dick, John Law, you're the fuzz, the heat, you're poison, you're trouble, you're bad news. These are their stories. Everybody loves that hunky Troy Aikman who's in the booth, the superstar former quarterback who's now... I think he's a really good commentator, actually. I think he's great analysis. I'd put him up there at the top. He uh, is going out with somebody named Haley Clark. Now, uh, she was fired and temporarily banned from Nordstrom. And the reason is that she is accused of stealing nearly $4,000 worth of products. What? <laughs> He is 56. How old is Haley, Troy Aikman's girlfriend? They've been going out since June, Kim, these two cuties. He's a hunky ex-athlete, and she's a beautiful former employee of Nordstrom. (laughs) (laughs) How old is she? He's 56. She's Haley Clark. I'm seeing 27, says Natalie. Yeah, I'm going to say 27, 28. Yeah. 22, says Joe. Wow. Oh, that's that's really young. Joe's probably right. 26, says Spencer. Anything else? 36. Sticking your fingers. The answer... To the question, how old is Troy Aikman, who is 56, how old is his girlfriend, the now fired and temporarily banned from Nordstrom, Haley Clark? The answer is 34, everyone. We're looking for 34. Okay. So what happened is, and just to wrap it up, she essentially... Um, should know should know better. <laughs> she worked, uh, you know, as a director of sales at the Trunk Club, which is a Nordstrom-owned company. And... She was, uh, she got a ban, you know, she's fired and banned from all Nordstrom-owned properties. She's not allowed to Mm. set foot on any of them. She uh, was accused of sharing this uh, code that got you the stuff for for less money. And when you add it all up, there's about $4,000 worth of stuff that that would have, you know, gained, garnered that kind of, bottom line for uh, for Nordstrom. So um, hasn't affected the relationship of, uh, at least published in a published way, of yeah. Troy Aikman. But uh, So they continue fine, but they can go anywhere, the two of them. They can hold hands, they can be boyfriend, girlfriend, but they can't do it at Nordstrom. Nope. That's your law and disorder for today. Tune in again next time for more Law and Disorder on The Mark Thompson Show. All right, that's it. Let's roll. Hey, let's be careful out there. He's uh, he's divorced, so that's the... Uh, <laughs> he's on the divorce uh, rebound. He can know. really pick them, yeah. Well, he, uh, you know, uh, I would say, you know, there's never been anything like there's it. There's never been anything <laughs> like this. <laughs> Uh, we like to check things out that are going on in the uh, skies above us. This is Stories from the Sky. We have clearance, Clarence. Roger, Roger. What's our vector, Victor? Enough is enough! I have had it with these monkey-fighting snakes on this Monday to Friday plane! Everybody strap in! One of the things I like is anything that involves possibly expediting, which is a ding word, the process of getting on and off the plane. Right now, it's, you know, they call your various groups and that's supposed to help, but 
United Airlines is experimenting with a new boarding system prioritizing window seats. What? Squeezing into a window seat on a full flight can feel like a game of human Tetris, they say. Mm -hmm. For travelers who dread this kind of situation with a window seat or just wish they could get on the plane a little earlier, United Airlines has good news. Starting this month, on the 26th, United Airlines is going to implement a boarding process that puts window seat passengers in economy class on the plane ahead of their peers in the middle and aisle seats. Doesn't that make sense? A total sense. Absolutely I mean, right. Get everybody tucked into that furthest seat, and then you don't have all the people standing. There's never in the been aisle anything and like this. Time. <laughs> exactly. Get everyone tucked in, and then let the middle people in, and then let the aisle people in. Well, yeah. uh, ooh, it's a wild um, idea, but it just might work. It is going to be tried starting the 26th. They will assign passengers to seven boarding groups. It will still use a pre-boarding system for certain customers like disabilities, unaccompanied minors, active duty military, and all those people you have to wait for yeah. as you're at the gate. First class and business passengers are going to follow them. But then window, exit row seats, and non-revenue passengers will board, followed by middle and aisle seats. The last boarding group is reserved for basic economy on domestic flights as well as those who don't have a boarding group on their pass, according to this uh, statement mm. put out by United. Ren uh, says also... That's such, a, that's such a smart move. A yeah. good, good, good on United. Airlines. Good on United. Yeah. Ren also says back to front as well. So, you know, the people by the window in the far back get on first, right? I have because to say this, though. The problem on some level also is overhead space. Yeah. And so the people get on first, you know, sometimes they treat those overhead bins like they're storage lockers at public mm -hmm. storage. They have all this. It's like, what? where did this stuff come from? Right. So oftentimes if you're last, even though you have an aisle, you may not get any overhead space. Anyway, it's a good idea, though, because it does expedite yeah. the process. So um, they have a an acronym for it. Uh, window Middle Aisle Boarding System is uh it's called wilma i don't understand what what is the i and the uh, hang on a second for window w i window okay no i oh w i is a window and uh -huh. then what does the l stand for kim it's wilma i don't get it albert what is wilma <laughs> standing for either, but you know what i could have one thing to describe it there's never been anything like this <laughs> <laughs> Well, they have an acronym, but I don't understand how they got it. So anyway, that's that. It sounds Japan like a great idea. And yeah, like I said, good on United. Yes, United Airlines. Fine. They seldom get a, a round of applause on this show. So we'll, uh, we'll give it to them today. Um, the middle seat was the toughest. Japan Airlines adds extra flight to carry heavy sumo wrestlers. <laughs> Japan's flag carrier which is Japan Airlines, had to make last-minute changes to deal with excess weight, not from baggage, but from a group of passengers who were sumo wrestlers and are sumo wrestlers. JAL realized that two of its planes were at risk of going over the weight limit, Kim. And they're carrying the wrestlers who were on their way to yeah. this big tournament for a what? sports festival. So they got to get these wrestlers to the sports festival, and yet they're too heavy. Yeah. What do you do? Got to have a, separate, a second plane. Exactly. Right? Why are you yelling? Yeah. Two groups of the 27 total athletes were supported um, in such a way to allow them to take off on separate flights. And uh, they weighed in at an average of 264 pounds each. The average passenger weighs in at 154, they say. Anyway, congratulations to JAL for they scrambled flights for these two to... Um, for these two flights to essentially transport all of those wrestlers. And finally, imagine being, the, yeah. imagine being the the normal passenger, the non-sumo wrestler passenger boarding that air. <laughs> oh, no. And you see all these sumos get on? Yeah, You're right. In that the middle be... seat, and you have to get to your window. Like, oh, my gosh. This is going to be Yeah, tough. that that is true. That would be... Uh, that would There's be... never been anything like this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 
I'm laughing if you just joined us. Because Sorry, somebody, John. Sorry. Somebody yeah, named we John. We love you, John. Yeah, John, you, you're, we do love him. He's a regular, but he yeah, really yeah. doesn't want us to play that. Never been anything like it or anything well, else from Trump. A complaint and, is not the way to make that happen on this show. Well, also the way you complain when you please, 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 isn't Trump going to how dare you? Whatever. I cower in fear from John, but not Albert. He leans into it. Amazon is going to begin delivering medications by drone. Yeah. Drop my Xanax on the back porch. Amazon pharmacy customers located in College Station, Texas, can now get certain prescriptions via drone delivery. Albert is standing at the big board with a... Uh, Imagine anything ahead. that would go wrong with this. No. Yeah, what could possibly <laughs> yeah, go wrong? Yeah, it's pretty sci-fi, but Amazon is on the cutting edge of so many things, revolutionizing the way that we shop, and now they're attempting to do that for the way we get our medicine. This morning, Amazon Pharmacy launching drone delivery of prescriptions in 60 minutes or less. The program, starting in College Station, Texas, and eventually expanding, gives residents access to over 500 medications, treating common conditions, including flu, asthma, and pneumonia. Earlier this year, Walmart partnered with Alphabet's Wing to expand its drone delivery to the Dallas area, allowing residents to order groceries, household essentials, over-the-counter medicines, and more. Customers There's never have been become anything so like used this. to getting things so quickly that retail drones are just going to add to that speed to market. And this is one way that retailers are going to stay competitive and make sure that they don't attrition customers to their competitors. Here's how it works. At checkout, an eligible Amazon pharmacy customer can select free drone delivery. The pharmacist will fill the prescription and then it's loaded into the drone, which will make its drop at a delivery marker on the customer's property. The drones have AI-powered sense and avoid technology to navigate around people, pets, and power lines. When the drone takes off, it's checking to make sure the flight path is clear. And then once it reaches the destination, then it looks down to make sure the area is clear and, and that it's safe to deliver the package. As companies like mm. Walmart, Tell Amazon, and friends, Alphabet's Wing develop true. retail yeah. drones, the prevalence is expected to increase over 200% in 2024. Wow. Amazon leads the pack when it comes to delivery of product. So if Amazon is doing something innovative, you better believe that retailers are going to be in its wake trying to develop or at least take on that same technology in order to better serve their customer. This is that is a really big deal. I mean, it's mm -hmm. been talked about for a long time. Yeah, but that's a very, very big deal. That's not fake. That's real. No, exactly. And uh, the inner Bay Area native in me is thinking of the creative ways that people are going to be getting all the the drone items intercepting with their own drones, you know. Just oh, all this they're gonna stuff. they're gonna jump on the drone once it's there. They're gonna throw a blanket over it. It's gonna be it, it, there. The the level of harassment that those drones are going to experience will, I think, be very very large. Is it that hard to go to the pharmacy? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'll tell you, I went to the pharmacy the other day, if I can just share a personal story, and there might have been 50 people waiting for it. And I, I said, there's mm -hmm. just no way. And in my pharmacy, it's hard to find parking. It's all just awful. Yeah. So I left a message for it to be delivered, and I'm still waiting. Days and yeah, days, like course. a week's gone by. So I got to go back. But um, the drone thing sounds great to me. Um, my dogs have a dog door to my yard. They will be running around high on my pain meds. <laughs> yeah, if the animals break into the meds, you're in real trouble. So I assume that they contain it in some kind of a pill pack or something like that. But uh, that is Stories from the Sky for today. This has been Stories from the Sky. The captain has turned off the seatbelt sign, and you are now free to move about the cabin. How am I doing on time, Albert? Do I have to wrap this up, or am I okay? We're getting close. We forgot to mention, this is a follow-up uh, donation. He did donate for your martini. He forgot the Kimikaze early from awesome. Harry Magnum. Oh, that's Yay, great. Harry. Kimikaze gets big a big shout-out shout out from Harry Magnum. That's pretty cool. That's at the Red Jack. Red Jack Saloon, baby. That's where I get my heat on, right in there. They got yeah. some pretty cool IPAs in the ghetto. 
If the Niners make it to the Super Bowl, I will. I confirm here on the show, I will be watching it at the Red Jack. What? Wow, that's very cool. I love hearing Do that. Do they have a TV there? Oh, my God. They have it is they? the place to watch a okay. Niners game. The awesome. place to watch a Niners game. Yeah. Um, In San Francisco, I, unlike the Niners. <laughs> <laughs> I get what you did. I get what you did. Um. Very, very cool. Well, I appreciate everything. I wonder if I could just, since we do have um, another minute here, I got this uh, I got this voicemail about the anniversary. I'd been a KGO listener for at least 15 years, and while I was a fan of all the hosts and shows, in recent years it was a criminally short two-hour block starting at 10 a.m. that was the highlight of my listening day. Wow. Oh, On nice. October 6th of last year, not long after the show started, the host was cut off mid-sentence, and That's music you. started to play. Confused at first, I was heartbroken when I realized what had just happened. I used Twitter to commiserate with fellow listeners, to give words of support and well wishes to all the employees who suddenly found themselves out of work. It was there that I heard of something new was in the works, and I had been listening from that first show onward. You guys often say that the goal was to bring the radio show to this new format, and from where I stand, you've nailed it. And so... Now that I've completely blown through my 30 seconds, let me get to the thank yous. Tony, behind-the-scenes Superman who keeps the train on the tracks. Yeah. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, Tony. Super producer John Daly, thank you for all your hard work in helping to get the show off the ground huh? and for letting oh, me nice. know where I can find the nearest Whole Foods should I find myself in the swamp <laughs> of Florida. Fabulous producer I tell you John what a fantastic Daly. job you're doing, but I know you like to keep the bar low. So for fear of my heaping <laughs> praise upon you and raising expectations, instead, I thank you for doing what I never thought possible. Oh. Albert, thank Getting you. me to appreciate K-pop. <laughs> Kim, Iron Woman of the show, Kim, for bringing me the news of the day, for writing heard over the chat, and for all of your honesty, integrity, and insight that you bring oh. day wow. after day. Man. Thank you. Really likes you. I, of nice. course, cannot forget Courtney, David Katz, Belinda Weymouth, John wow. Roth, Jefferson Graham, David K. Johnson, Michael Shore, Jim Avila, Michael Snyder, and I'm sure I'm forgetting other people. They're all amazing. And finally, yes. the man with the voice born for radio, whose wow. dulcet baritone I look forward to coming out of my speakers daily, Shadow <laughs> oh. Stevens. Oh! oh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, He's you, kind of a big deal. You got it. You got the man, it. the uh. myth. The legend, mm. the guy who spearheaded all of this and made it possible, mm. who's worked tirelessly, who's sacrificed to wow. bring this show to us wow. every day. Build up. By stepping up and doing this, you are making a difference in people's lives Man. and in the world. Man. And here is a hell of a milestone. I can't yeah. wait to see what's next. Oh. And so, from the bottom of my heart, a big shout out to the one, the only, Mark Tom. <laughs> oh, I see what you did. You played yourself off with our old game. All right. Uh, that was very funny. I Who liked was that? it. And I'm trying to, it's been sitting in my inbox um, as just an audio file. Albert, I don't know who it is. Oh, do you have man. the name on it, Albert? Do you have it, buddy, or not? Uh, I don't. Let me do some digging here. We'll have it for you. <laughs> It's really great. That and was I an awesome message. I love yeah, it. I hadn't listened to the whole thing. Um, but uh, that is epic. It really is epic. That made, you know, one of our great greetings. We had some great ones. So uh, thank you. We'll find it and we'll belatedly give you acknowledgement love tomorrow. It. Yeah. Really, really great, man. That was really funny and well done and, yeah. um, and thorough. The Whoever other thing you I wanna... are, you're awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, Albert, what about the, uh, did you have a video also to share? Um, I didn't no? have any lined up today. Okay. No, no yeah. new ones. We had just a, a couple old well, ones. We had a couple that we didn't get to last week. Yeah. All right, God, I tell you. I, the reason, because we have two different producers day to day, so it's different yeah. to, um, yeah. Anyway. That's going to change that we're going to start to just going to reorganize the schedule so we have a little more of a um, through line. But yeah. anyway, um, really appreciate that. And I do have some really funny videos. If you want to see all the videos that were uh, up to a certain point, I think a couple came in after this was created. Tony created essentially, um, what is that, a compilation of everything? Yeah. And it's there on really our nice video. channel. Yeah. So yeah, can, there's never there's never been anything like that. 
I think we've all learned a lot about each other today. Yes, we have. Yeah. Uh, appreciate the um, the input on situations that feel intractable. I'm talking about the one in the Middle East, mm-hmm. where all the news seems to be a bit on the grim side. Thank you all for sharing different perspectives, asking for different perspectives, offering uh, thoughts on different perspectives, and also on reasonable history about the region, you know. Um, The uh, other thing I wanted to mention to you is that tomorrow, David Katz joins us. We'll talk the law, Supreme Court. They made a serious decision about ghost guns that snuck in under everything, so we'll get to that. And we'll follow I'm the Sheriff House. Stevens for the Mark Johnson Show. Mm. Bye bye. We'll follow the dysfunctional GOP in the House of Representatives oh, tomorrow. Bye-bye. The After Party Live is bye-bye. next. Bye-bye. Until bye-bye. tomorrow. Bye bye.